Not in the face! Thank you. Hello and welcome to Hey, Not the Face with your host, John Nash, and your producer, me, Steffi Haynes. And today we have a PFL episode. Now, there's other topics in here, but we focused a good bit on PFL. We just had the big PFL versus Bellator event. So we're going to start in with that and work our way out to some other topics. But first... Let's find out how our fearless leader is. John, how the hell are you? It's been a couple of weeks. It has. And I'm here. Tired today, but I'm here. I, look at that. Just for the listeners, I am here braving, I don't know, braving terrible, you know, mediocre L.A. weather. <laughs> well, at least it's not flooding anymore. So there's No, that. but it's supposed to start raining up again later in the week. So, And, and the worst news, I got that the Midwest, where I'm originally from years ago, uh, it's next Monday. It's they're predicting like 68 degrees. Wow. It's 80 degrees here in Texas. Like right now it's 11 Oh five PM and it's still 72 degrees here on February 25th. That's a little too hot. That's a little too warm in the winter time for me. <laughs> yes. But anyways, we digress. We're going to go ahead and get right into it. First question. What? If anything, does Bellator winning five to one say about the two entities and PFL's acquisition of Bellator? Well, it shouldn't have been surprising to most people. I think most people that pay attention to MMA favored the Bellator champions, uh, wildly favored them. And so it, what it says is what we already know that Bellator has the better top end fighters and in it's also what it says is why they hired Bellator because PFL for all their talk that Don Davis does that they they were the co even before they acquired Bellator that they're the co leader that they put on events of the quality of the UFC the talent level on their events has not been that spectacular right they have some they have some decent fighters I'm not you know I'm not saying they don't have some uh, they have some fighters that are ranked in the top 25 of fight matrix is what they use all the time. But they don't have really many elite fighters. And what Bellator has, they don't match the UFC, but they've done in the last few several years a pretty good job of recruiting and retaining some talented fighters. You know, we got AJ McKee. Aaron Pico actually starting to look really good. Yes, he is. He has turned his fortunes around. Yeah, you can go to, I mean, and Nemkov mm -hmm. is moving to heavyweight. Looks absolutely looks like, I'm, I'm not going to say, but I, I would say M Nemkov looks like he's a serious top five heavyweight mm -hmm. potential. So they have serious, maybe not the best fighter in the weight class, although some of them are arguable, but they have guys that you would seriously say they are top five talent. Maybe not ranking because it's hard to get ranked when you don't have other high ranking guys to beat, but top, they have several top five talents in Bellator, something that PFL was missing. So I think that's what it tells you is Bellator had the better talent. Um, and Bellator is why that, that talent level is why PFL acquired them. Do you think it was successful for Bellator uh, as far as pay-per-view sales or, or with the Saudis? Yeah. Well, I guess Bellator PFL because it was a PFL event. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's uh, – well, honestly, I think it was – I guess it, it depends on how you view it. Pay-per-view sales-wise, I doubt this did that good on pay-per-view. Um, people will think, oh, there's interest Bellator versus PFL. And you see a lot of like, I guess, hardcore, uninformed, hardcore fans. I think I would describe them as because they're, they're fans of MMA and they follow it very well, but they don't really understand how the business works too well. They're not in, you know, they're not like boxing fans. They're not, they're not following how they, they're not, they're not, they have been Dave Meltzer fans for decades and MMA payout is that. And just because you have Bellator versus PFL and it's their top fighters, that would not make it a pay-per-view sale. We know pay-per-views generally sell when you have on the main event and it has to be a big fight that there's a lot of interest in. And even though this was the PFL versus Bellator champs, the really they weren't that great of matchups, right? The, I think often it was like the number eighth ranked, uh, you know, in one division for Bellator versus the 23rd ranked guy from PFL. So this is not even on a UFC like fight night. There's often better quality main events on them in the sense of high rank matchups. So I don't think this did this. There was no major stars. There was no major matchups that the general public wanted to see. It was a gimmick. And I give them credit. They were able to create a gimmick 
that they could they could do something with, but I don't think it sold much on pay-per-view. On that, it wasn't a success. The bigger question, because because it was held in Saudi Arabia, the Saudis probably put up a lot of money for it, and, and that was that's why they could hold it. They pay for it. The question is, are the Saudis happy with it? Now, Ant Evans, who knows some people, he said his he heard that the Saudis weren't happy with the results they got. I don't know if that's true. But the key to this success is, were the Saudis happy? Because you're not going to make your money on pay-per-view. It's going to be the 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 site beat for the Saudis, and I don't know if they're happy or not with it. Ant would probably know those things, though, right? He still has his fingers pretty much all over the the matrix, so to speak. Yeah, he knows. I mean, he has sources. He's not making like some people. He's not often making stuff up. But the right. question is, what? Who are the sources? And you know, it was sure. it was kind of quick turnaround information. So you'd I'd wait a while before. I think you'd want to talk to multiple people to see before what the reaction from several people was to this event. Do you think PFL is happy that Hennen Ferreira beat Ryan Bader? Well, I think they're happy with the way he beat him on a, you know, basically one punch knockout. Uh, I think that they're happy with. I mean, I don't think they're too upset that he beat Bader because Bader, um, is you know he's not he's a well known fighter, but I don't know what the upside is. And 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 Hennon he looks scary. He's big, and so that was impressive. So I think they were happy with the way he won, but he's not he's not a well known fighter. He's not a highly rated fighter. Uh, he's going to move up on the win, but I I don't think he's you know he, you don't have a ma- massive star right now. I'll say that. Wow, what about Engano? Do we think he was happy with it and? Do we think they actually fight? Because, man, it's looking like Ngannou is going to leave MMA in the rearview mirror. Well, it was noteworthy. Instead of coming into the ring and facing off with them, he left the arena, right? Yes. So it makes me have some questions there. Uh, I mean, PFL, I think in a sense, you could see that they're maybe kind of happy that uh, that they have – uh, for our win because it look he might look good against you know on a poster that they can sell against Ngano is like this big guy, but it's not a really marketable fight. He's not a major star yet, right? Now I'm sure he's happy because he is earmarked now to get according to Ngano's contract to get two million dollars as the opponent mm-hmm. minimum. So he gets he should be very happy. He get he's got a two million dollar payoff. The thing with Ngano though is. I mean, if he beats or looks good against Joshua, does he want to come back and fight in the PFL for, you know, I mean, he'll make $10 million, but compare that to uh, if he beats Joshua, he's looking probably at a $50, $60 million payday. I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. He's looking at a yeah. ridiculous purse to fight for the heavyweight title if he beats Joshua. So does he come back and risk injury or something, something happening? Uh, and ruining his fight at the heavyweight title for ten million. I mean, I know he has equity in the in Af- the Africa part, and he probably has some interest in promoting that. But even as that, is that worth risking this massive purse in boxing? Nope. <laughs> I, I no. would say no. Yes, definitely. But <laughs> one thing weird about Nganu. Wait, I got a question though. Before you yeah. go in, does he have to fight in PFL? I mean, is it set in stone that he must give them a fight? Well, his contract, my understanding is his contract is a two fight deal and every year he has to fight for PFL. Has oh. to, but has to in a sense contractually they have to give him a fight every twelve months. But okay. you can't force people to fight. Okay. And I guess it would de- 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 depend on the um the contractual terms between boxing, what his carve up. But my understanding was that they, they have the PFLs for MMA only and he's allowed to go box on his own and negotiate all his own deals. So technically, they can't force him. It sounds like they can't force him to fight MMA if he doesn't want. He can just continue to box, right? And at first, PFL was probably very happy with that at first because they're like, well, we don't have to pay this big payday to him. We don't have an opponent for him. It's not going to sell. Uh, and he gets to keep his – his uh he gets more famous with every fight. You know, he just gets to be a bigger and bigger figure. But now they're probably looking at it like, listen, eventually this contract's I'm sure has you know a sunset clause on it, right? Yeah. I'm sure he put in a termination date. They have to be looking at it like, well, it was great when he's building up his renown, but now he's very well known, and if he continues to box, we are never going to take advantage of that. 
And we also eventually we do want him to step in the cage to take advantage of his prestige and try to sell some pay-per-views because we need that to keep our investors. So PFL now I think would want to. And, and part of me questions if this announcement that the winner between uh, uh, on the PFL versus Bellator event was going to be his next opponent. Was that something that they fully came into agreement with Ngano ahead of time? I'm not sure of that because he didn't seem 100%. He, you know, he didn't walk in the cage. So that suggests to me that maybe mm-hmm. he's he's saying, I don't want to make this guy think that he's next when it might not be next, right? And so, but PFL, they were trying to hype the event, trying to find a way to sell it. Like, let's start market this as the fight to decide who fights Ngano. Let me ask you this. Uh, are PFL shitting their pants right now? I wouldn't say shitting their pants right now over the fact that Ngano might not fight with right, them. Right, right. I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, they still do. The, they're getting the benefit of Ngano being part of the PFL without having to pay them. But I do think they they have to be somewhat nervous because they have pitched this business model where they're going to hold several, a couple pay-per-views per year. And again, only a handful of people sell. Mm-hmm. And they're two, they're three... When that was announced, they had three basically big potential pay-per-view sellers, right? They had Branson Gano, they signed the number one heavyweight in the world, this who is now just gotten bigger and bigger, so big we question if he'll ever fight in MMA. Jake Paul as a name, right? But who does boxing, and does he really want to fight MMA in a, a sport where he probably has much less chance of winning, right? Mm-hmm. And harm, harm his brand. And third, Kayla Harrison... And so they acquired Bellator against Cyborg. That was a very marketable fight, but now she's left. And so they're now doing stuff like the PFL versus Bellator. And I am, I do think, I'm sure some of them thought, oh, if we do PFL versus Bellator, this will get enough interest to sell pay-per-views. I'm sure some of them thought that, but they should, hopefully they have some people there telling them that, no, that's not what's going to sell pay-per-views. What's going to sell pay-per-views is Francis Ngannou versus a, a, an opponent that people want to see him against. And Don Davis said that very thing in an interview. So I hope that that's what they're, they they seem to acknowledge it there. So hopefully they understand that, but that's what they're missing. And now they haven't gone to the star, but they don't, they need to get them in the cage, but they don't really have an opponent. So for, I mean, if Ngano had them, if they had a, a very legitimate opponent that could draw against Ngano, it's very likely, or at least much more likely that they'd say, listen, I'm going to box, but why not come back to PFL? Because my contract pays me 10 million minimum. And on top of that, I get double digit pay per, per pay per view buy, so I could be looking at twenty, thirty million fighting MMA. Then he might he might be much more motivated to come back to MMA. Let's talk about the opponent for Francis Ngannou. Why do you think they invited John Jones, and who do you think invited John Jones to this PFL event over the weekend? Well, I can only guess. And my guess is it was it came through the Saudis made the pitch, but I'm, I'm guessing maybe someone in PFL working with the Saudis wanted them there, right? The you know bring because it's it was very clever to bring John Jones there, brings attention, brings it, it makes kind of a viral moment. You, everybody on Twitter will share it, but Jones on Jones' part, I think he went because this you know he's trying to make a Saudi contact because the, they they're throwing tons of money around right now, and everybody seems to want to be friendly with them. And on the PFL side, they want him there because it's just great. You know, it's a great media moment to show him there. Okay. What do you think about the questions that they asked him specifically about fighting Francis? Well, I didn't like the way, and I I talked to uh, Patrick Auger on Twitter. Didn't talk, but we tweeted back and forth a little bit. I didn't like the way they questioned it, but I give him credit I, I was pretty impressed they brought up specifically him fighting Ngannou and then mm-hmm. brought up that there's only one person standing in the way of that fight, and it's not the PFL, right? Mm-hmm. So I give him credit because that makes that's something the hardcore MMA fan base that is watching the PFL on Twitter will probably latch on to more. Now, it's pure PR, but I, I thought it was very clever of them to get that interview, and I was very surprised – that they got the questions off. And I was also somewhat surprised that Jones came up to take questions from him while he was there. Yeah. That's I was the surprised part that kinda... too. Because yes. the, would, would the UFC frown on him being there? I'm just curious if you think that. Well, they, they might frown on the fact that he was being asked those questions, but he he's very diplomatic. And I think they'll be happy with the way he answered them, but they might not be happy. That the fact he was put in that situation being asked the questions, but 
but I think they, I don't think they're going to take it out on Jones. I think he answered in a way that was very kind of, you know, the UFC is going to be happy with his answers and they're just going to be more annoyed that the PFL pulled that and got him on there. I think that's it. But, uh, him fighting Ngannou was, you know, that was a great question by it. The way, the way they set that up. I mean, I thought I would have done a little more natural because it felt so artificial the way they set it up. But, uh, and I thought you could have got a better answer out of them from it if asked differently. But just the fact that they got him to ask it and then bring up the point that there, which was right why Jones was there, that there's only one person standing in the way, I thought was it was somewhat comical. Yeah, yeah. Is there a chance that we can ever actually see Francis Ngannou versus John Jones? Well, I don't want to say there's no chance, but there's very little chance. But I'll say there's a couple things made possible. One is that the Saudis want it they could throw a ton of money at both promotions to get it done. Right. The one thing is for UFC, it's gotta be, it, it, it would have to be a ton of money because kind of unlike uh, McGregor versus Mayweather, there was no downside to McGregor. I mean, or very little potential downside to McGregor going into boxing and losing because it was a boxing, a different sport. He's going to come back. Uh, it just increases brand. The only bad thing was that they, McGregor made a bunch of money and they don't like their fighters. And this is me, Dana White, saying the fighters should mm-hmm. make so much, right? Mm-hmm. So that was the bad on that. But on this, the bad part is if Jones fights, the risk is even if the UFC gets paid a ton of money by the Saudis, right? And Jones goes and gets killed by Ngannou. Now they got to worry that there's a, a major, uh, everybody will see that the, the number one heavyweight is outside the UFC, right? For sure. Because they can make the argument, even, every, even though Ngannou was the number one heavyweight and left, Jones came in and, and without fighting him, everybody can now make the claim that he's the number one heavyweight. <laughs> so that's their big fear. The other problem was would be, let's say the the Saudis just said, we really want this fight and we're going to give both sides $100 million to make it happen, right? Well, the UFC might go, that's great because we get to make a ton of money on this. But is John Jones going to be very excited to walk in the cage when he finds out that of that $100 million, <laughs> He gets twenty million, and and God was keeping eighty million of his side. <laughs> you know, I, I think at that point the fight might fall apart because John Jones is going to be furious at the fact that he's getting a fraction of what God is going to make because of the contract. <clears throat> so I, I think that would be the hurdle. The way it would get made, I think, and this is the other thing: France and Ghana's contract. Again, I don't know the the sunset clause, but he only has a two fight deal apparently with the PFL. And two years. So that his contract could be up in, um, I don't know, another year, year and a half maybe, let's say. He would be another free agent. Maybe the interest is so vast, the UFC says, let's make the fight. But again, you run into that problem. Do you cut a deal where Ngannou is going to make multiples with Jones makes? And yes. if that's the case. <laughs> yes, I want to see the fight. Yes. <laughs> yeah, But then Jones is not going to agree to the fight because he's going to hold out to make more. And Ngannou, who's so used to making? the boxing paydays now, is not going to take a major pay cut to come back to the UFC. But so if, you're, you're going to be in that dilemma. In your scenario, though, if he's a free agent and they, they get him to come back for one or two fights, how would he know what Francis is making? Because we know the UFC locks down those numbers and doesn't like, you know, fighter X it, knowing I, what I think fighter would, Y I is think making. It, I think it would come out, there would be some, you couldn't stop, because there'd be several, and we're in Gano, because he negotiates like a boxer now, the numbers are easier to get a hold of, because there's multiple parties hearing the information, right? Right. Where on the UFC side, it's basically the UFC talking to the fighter directly, and that's it. In has got people he's working with, there's going to be multiple parties that are going to be aware of what he's being offered. And and just the fact that people are going to realize what he made in boxing, and they're going to ask, "Are you making less?" And I I don't see Gano saying, you know, I think he'll be some maybe he won't give the number, but he'll be honest and say, "No, I'm not making any less." And then you'll instantly know what he's kind of making, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, the number we might not never get an exact number, uh, but it would become pretty obvious, I think, pretty quickly that uh, and and there's leaks in the UFC too. Someone in the UFC might just do that just to f with John Jones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So let's talk about the other big earner out there, and Conor McGregor. What do you think is going on with McGregor and the UFC? Because we have Dana out there vocally saying that he doesn't know what's going on with Conor. He actually said in an interview that he didn't know if Conor would fight again. And I quote, he makes a lot of money, so that complicates things. End quote. So what yeah. do you think is going on there? Well, 
yeah, that, I mean, because he's rich is the kind of the common saying Dano says, right? Which doesn't make quite make sense. Maybe in Connor's situation, because he has a lot of money, he doesn't want to fight. But the way Dana always brings that up, like people have a lot of money, don't want to fight anymore. It's not stopping Canelo Alvarez, nope. right? Canelo's making a ton of money worth hundreds and hundreds of millions, worth as much, if not more, than Conor McGregor, makes more than Conor McGregor. And he's still out fighting several times a year against, you know, top competition. Although, uh, from the word sound of it, doesn't sound like he's taking the best guys in this uh, this year. He's turning yeah. shooting down some of the better uh, fight matchups. To he needs to fight other. Benavidez and get he it out of the way. The, that that and, uh, uh, tangent here, just to, we go off on a <laughs> side tangent. Here. The, for Canelo, I have no problem if Canelo doesn't want to fight Benavidez for any reason, right? What I have a problem with is Benavides is the number one contender mm. at that weight class, right? The number one ranked fighter beneath Al, uh, Canelo at 168. Well, if that's the case, strip him of the belt. You are not defending the guy that you should be defending right. against. We have no, I have no problem with you not fighting him if you don't want to, but you cannot be called the champion at 168 in any of the, the sanctioning orgs if you're unwilling to defend it against the best guys. That's just my, my thinking on it, but... Okay, well, back to back to McGregor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, McGregor says, and the other thing is, McGregor says he wants to fight repeatedly. Says yes. he's almost like he's frustrated looking for the fight, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple theories, I guess we could say, about what's going on. We've talked about it in the past. One is uh, his contract is just being held out, extended, and be partly, even though maybe he had a sunset clause, but because he took that retirement for a while to. I don't want to say juice, but let's say juice. Uh, <laughs> uh, he he Just is say. it's extended and it's not up. <laughs> That's one. UFC two might not want to get him to burn out his last two fights because they want him under contract as they're negotiating their next deal because they want to use it like, listen, you're going to sign us and we have some big Conor McGregor fights going to be on that new contract. And don't you know as part of the like, don't you want Conor McGregor fighting selling over a million pay per views after we come to the new deal? So they might be using that for that. I mean, I don't know for sure, but it sounds like it's some sort of, and I've talked to people about this in the business, and a lot of them assume that there seems to be some negotiation going on. Something behind the scenes is going on um, because you have McGregor saying he wants to fight, Dana saying he's not interested, and he only has two fights left on his deal. And then there's, of course, Chandler out there saying it's definitely happening. I don't know who's telling him that. But Wait, I got to ask you about Mike Chandler then. Let, yeah. Let's back the truck up for just a moment. Mike Chandler went out on this past Monday and did this pathetic, pitiful call out of Conor McGregor. It was 21 seconds long. I know because I, I wrote the post on it, but it was 21 seconds long. He ran out of oxygen and basically his, his last words sort of trailed off into the ether. But the, the point is, he said, that Conor McGregor was holding things up. But that's not the truth, is it? Well, we don't know 100%. He possibly could be holding up because he'd be holding up for more money. He'd be but holding it up be because Conor and the UFC, and more so the UFC for not basically ponying up the money for their biggest money maker. Well, it also reminds me a bit of everybody saying Nate Diaz was holding things up mm -hmm. when Nate Diaz was being offered fights with people besides uh, Chimaev, mm -hmm. all the other people, and people weren't aware that Diaz's contract, the off the bout offer that he was getting included, an extension to his contract. So he would right. only get the Dustin Poirier fight if he signed a multi-fight agreement right. that extended his contract. So, but people would say, oh, Nate Diaz is holding up because he won't sign the agreement. Yeah, he won't sign the agreement because he's extending his contract. It's very possible that's what's going on with mm -hmm. uh, McGregor, that his Chandler contract has some extension. So it continues past the two fights. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know exactly. There's something going on there, but I don't know exactly because I don't know if McGregor, we don't know if he has a sunset. We'd assume he does because the way the contracts were written at that time, everybody should have one. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of why you would have inserted him. Uh, that, so you assume he has that, but we, I don't know how long he was officially retired for, when it would extend to. And I also, it's just, it's very possible too, as other people have mentioned to me, it's possible that he has some sort of balloon payment bonus if he fights out his contract. Mm -hmm. And so he's adamant about finishing that contract to get that. I don't know if this is true, just, just people are, you know, kind of guessing or, you know, uh, but if that's, but it seems plausible if he's waiting to fight it out to get that payment. And so the UFC is holding that against him to 
and making them wait as long as possible for the deal. Um, so uh, it's hard to say, but there, it seems like there's definitely something going on. Do you think it's fair to say that Dana White doesn't understand, understand the concept of legacy? Uh, well, I guess, I mean, Dana White always taught, well, Dana understands it when it means you're not taking the cheaper deal. Because I, I say that because he frequently refers to fighters making a lot of money, not wanting to continue. And you brought up Canelo Alvarez. I mean, we could we could point at multiple NFL players, Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey. We could look at look at LeBron James. Look at Steph Curry. Look how long Shaquille O'Neal hung on. Charles Barkley. They hung on until they had to be forced out, till their knees gave out. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think he would everybody would point out that fighting's a little different. But I mean, we have the exact we have the comparison mount right there, the yardstick of boxing, which is almost a very similar to MMA in some ways more brutal because there's a lot more headshots, the thing you're more worried about. And you have guys like Anthony Joshua, and we know what he makes, and it's mm-hmm. you know, he's made hundreds of millions over the years, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we know because the the company house in the UK, he files what he earns with them, mm-hmm. his, his his personal, you know, basically his company himself. He's made hundreds of million, and yet he's still out there fighting, right? Yeah. Even after several losses, uh, Tyson Fury is making tens of millions of fights. He's still out there. Uh, all these guys are making tons of money and still doing it. So McGregor, it, yeah, it could be his legacy. The thing about Dana is kind of funny because he'll bring up if you don't take the fight because you want more money, then you're, oh, you don't care about your legacy. You're not. You don't want to <laughs> fight the best. <laughs> yeah. Right. So he's... then, then he knows he's all aware of legacy. But if if they're if they're then going to fight, if he doesn't want the fight made, oh, you're asking for too much. It's always you can't win because he can always take one or the other mm-hmm. based on whatever one makes him look in the UFC look better. I still don't think that the basic concept of it actually sinks in with him. Now, let me ask you this. Could Conor McGregor use the Ali Act to get out of his contract? Well, th- this was an. I wrote an article years ago about this concept, and it kind of took off. But it seemed like McGregor was very well. In fact, he was well aware. He said in interviews he could do that. The very thing that was outlined in my my article, which I got from people in the business, so it was you know I'm sure he got the same information from people as well. So, so that was always on the table. And there's some theories that the threat of it is what got the UFC thinking maybe we should go along with this Mayweather fight back then. Now. Could he still do it? Well, it makes some sense because besides, you know, Chandler, you know, fighting the MMA, there are potentially, you know, boxing matches available. To, the, and the Saudis have said they'd love to have Conor McGregor fight or box even. I think he even said box in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, there's money there. But I, I talked to Sam Spera, one of the, you know, Randy Couture's mm-hmm. old manager. Mm-hmm. And he's one of the guys that thinks about this stuff a lot. He knows a lot. He still thinks that's a that's a – that's a p- very plausible, uh, you know, or viable solution to a fighter. The, the the problem is, is that when the Mayweather fight was on the table, right, the amount of money on the table for a Mayweather fight was so, so, so great. It was worth taking the risk to go that route because you would still face some litigation from the UFC and there's no guarantee that you would win in that litigation. Well, now, I guess the newer fighters have the arbitration clause. We'd have to consider how that's going to be ruled on. You have to go to arbitration or not. But older fighters like McGregor that have an older contract, you would still have to go to court. And is the money on the table now for any potential fights, is it big enough that it'd be worth doing that route to take that risk? And that's the question. I don't know. Hmm. All right. So we're going to segue into another topic here and that is we had the list of witnesses come out that the uh that zufa plans on calling to testify on their behalf and there were two things in there that really got me um one is that none of the fighters not a single one opted out of the lawsuit but (laughs) Donald Cerrone is in there going to testify on their behalf, even though he's actually suing them. And then there was, um, there was somebody else in there that Michael Chandler, Michael Chandler wasn't even in the UFC at the time, but he's going to be testifying on their behalf. And those two things just sort of stood out to me. I want to know what stood out to you. 
Well, I think what struck me to a lot of people is that Misha Tate was on the list because if you made a list, what everybody calls, I guess the the company men, the the other people on the list would all would all fit that. Everybody knows Chael Sonnen is very pro UFC. Michael Bisbing, uh, Chandler, uh, Donald Cerrone, all those. None of I don't think people were surprised by any of those, but people were somewhat surprised by Misha Tate. Now for Chandler, the fact that he didn't fight during the uh, the class period, I got a feeling that that might get him excluded, mm-hmm. that they might contest his t- uh, testifying and then he might be excluded because he's not a class member. But uh, I'm not sure, but I, I got a feeling they'll at least attempt that. And we'll see if he ends up testifying or not. But that that's the only the only real surprise for me was that. Uh, well, I tell you, the truth, actually, I was surprised a couple names and, I, you know, we'll get to them in a bit. But I was surprised a couple of names of the fighters and managers were on the list because I don't think they're. They're good witnesses. Ali, for instance. Yeah, well, yeah, if you want to talk about that, I think both Ali, Abdelaziz, and uh, and Chael Sonnen, I think that they have their their history of comments and, and actions could come back to haunt them. And, and supposedly, and I don't know if it's true, but supposedly there's communications with Ali, you know, that he has said something that he's, you know, he, you know, he's out there to help the UFC. If that's true, and they have that because of discovery, they could pull it up during his, you know, as evidence during his testimony, I don't know if that helps you. They have a have. I don't know if it helps Ali to have that become public. Why so would the plaintiffs not want him then? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I I'm just curious why they would want to ex. Uh, ex- well, I think they want to exclude everybody's testimony. Okay, as unnecessary. They're going to across the board everybody. But I think the two people that you would think that would be the least risk of damage is Abdelaziz uh, because of his history. You know, he was a uh, 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 competent informant for the uh, New York Police Department. He supposedly there's communications. I don't know if they're true, but there's a lot of hints that there's communication between him and the UFC that could come out publicly about where maybe he's not thinking in the best interest of his fighters. I'm surprised, like yeah, I said, I'm surprised he would want that out there. And then on top of it, you have uh, Chael Sonnen, who's, you know, he has a criminal record. Uh, we have multiple times him lying about what he earned in the UFC. So it just, he doesn't seem like a great, um, would be a great witness. Some of the other fighters probably wouldn't be as bad, but those two just do not seem like they'd be great witnesses. I need to, you to go back. Why Misha Tate is so shocking. Cause you didn't explain it yet. Well, I mean, shocking me because she, if you made a list of company people, right, mm-hmm. she's not one of the people that comes up. In fact, she worked for one for a while. So you don't see her being, uh, listed as the company on the company man or company woman list. Uh, the, Ronda Rousey, back, surprisingly, though. was when she was with the UFC. She doesn't seem like it is anymore, but she was she was wheeled out every time they needed something done for her to be a public uh, make a public appearance on behalf of the UFC. Hmm. What about um, subpoenas or volunteering? How How is that going? Who's subpoenaed and who's volunteering? Well, all these people, and I've seen this on Twitter, uh, some people, again, not the best informed people on Twitter, but arguing that these fi- these fighters and managers don't have an option. They're being subpoenaed to uh, uh, appear in court, that they ha- they're being forced to, compelled to com- uh, appear. But I don't know, only which of these people live in... Um, in Vegas. The only person I think lives in Vegas, I don't even know if she does anymore, was Misha Tate, right? Right. So that's if that's the case, there's a rule called Rule 45, or is it Rule 45C? Uh, and that is if if you to appear in testimony, you have to live. They can only compel you to appear and, and testify as a witness if you live within 100 miles of the trial. Uh, for these uh, federal civil procedures, like antitrust cases. So if you don't live within 100 miles, they can't compel you to appear in court to testify. So all these people, Bisbing lives in Orange County. So he has to be electing to show up on his own. They can't do uh, Zoom. I'm just asking this uh, just in case somebody out there listening. Well, you can do a Zoom. The court could allow a Zoom, but they can't. A Zoom doesn't count as part of the compelled to testify. In other words, you you still have to live physically within 100 miles. Okay. Okay. And so and for this trial, too, I don't think they're going to allow for Zoom conference calls unless it's uh, for some medical. They did with Joe Silva for his own personal medical reasons. He couldn't show up. But. All the other people, they they had to test. They have to show up in person. So unless you live within a hundred mile radius of the the courthouse, you can't be forced to come and testify. And my understanding, Bisbing's in Orange County. Chael, I think, is still up in Northwest or Oregon or Seattle or something like that. 
Uh, all, you know, people, uh, Dan Lambert is over in, uh, Florida. Yeah. Uh, Olive Del Z's in New Jersey, is it? New Jersey. Yeah. So all of them are outside, well outside Vegas. And so that means they must have elected to come testify on behalf of the UFC. Outside Ali Abdelaziz and Chael Sonnen, is there anybody else that they have selected to testify that it might backfire on them? Well, I mean, it all depends on what kind of information the, the plaintiffs have or, or what they're going to. We don't know what they're going to testify either. Some of them might not have good things to say or what they end up testifying might not be to the UFC's benefit. And the UFC might not realize that until they get in you know in front of the court and they're like, oh, crap, we really did need you to say that. But you said that. So um, but and it also doesn't there's also possibility that there's some pieces of evidence that the the defendants missed. And so when, a, like I say, a manager shows up and they have some te- emails that they miss, like that make the guy look bad, uh, that could be a possibility. But the only two that I, that to me just seem obviously like it'd be poor choices. There's the, I've said before, Chael and uh, Ali. I'm going to tell you a couple of things real quick. And I want you to tell me if Donald Cerrone could backfire on them because one, he went on Joe Rogan's show and basically talked about there was no red panty night for him that the UFC only paid him his standard purse to fight Conor McGregor. And two, when he was there at the Power Slap event as one of their emissaries, and he goes and he says, if you want to see CTE in action, this is the event. And I'm not saying he's being malicious. I'm being sa- I'm saying he's being a big dumb dummy. He, well, I don't think the the power slap comment is going to even appear because it has nothing to sure, do. Sure, but case. I, what I, no, no. What I'm I'm not saying that that's what he's going to say. What I'm saying is he's setting a precedent of saying dumb things without realizing that they're dumb. Well, that I mean, that's why I said it's the possibility that it could backfire, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the UFCs they're probably going to say, listen, he didn't get a big red panty night against you know McGregor, but he willingly signed this contract. He was happy, and we have him here testifying that he was happy to sign it. And then the defendants will come in and say, you know, the plaintiffs, I mean, will have him say, well, yeah, I didn't make as much as you know, very much money off that fight, but I was happy to sign it. So the the defendants, UFC, might be happy with that testimony, but there is a chance that he says something, intentionally or not. Like you said about the CT, where he just basically says, "I, you know, maybe he slips out and says something like, I never thought I had a choice or option. There was mm-hmm. just nowhere better to go. Something like that that could come back to haunt the UFC. So there's and always that possibility as well. That's where I was going with that, because he seems to just say whatever is on his mind with no filter. So I'm thinking that a loose ca- he he strikes me as a loose cannon, so to speak. So I'm thinking that having him testify might not be in their best interest. Well, it would also be interesting to, and I, I don't know if it'd make that big a deal, but it would be interesting to hear like, you were part of Bjorn Rebney's uh, MMA, MMAAA, right? <laughs> and and you wanted to improve the, you know, you were talking at the time that UFC needed to be improvement, but you know, so do you still stand by that? Of course, the next day he said, I had no idea what I was doing. So <laughs> that's the great thing about uh, Donald Stroni, he's kind of like, he's almost like a, a He's like a poet. His uh, his waters are muddy, so they look deep. <laughs> All right. So on that fine note, we're going to go into our last topic. And that, that last topic is Ryan Garcia. Now, he said that he might be all the way up to $100 million in earnings from boxing after the Devin Haney fight. Is that possible? Honestly, I don't think it is, but he's not far off. I, I saw the little interview, and everybody went with the hundred million. But he originally said anywhere from eighty to a hundred million after the Haney fight. Now, I think that's based on an assumption that the Haney fight does well. But honestly, he might not be that far off. He makes some money off sponsorship, you know. And he, as an influencer, he makes some on his, uh, his social media accounts. He actually makes money from that compared to most people in boxing. And on top of that, he got over. We know he got over thirty million to fight uh, Tank Davis, right? He, we know he made several million on multiple of his other fights, and then now this next fight with Haney's at least going to be eight figures. So you add that up, and it's it, depending. He might not be at eighty million, but he's got to be probably close to it. It's not. It's not. On, it's not impossible to imagine he'll hit eighty million if the Haney fight does good. 
I find it very hard to believe uh, that uh, he will that it's going to do so good that he'll hit the hundred million dollar mark. It's not going to be like uh, you know Ryan Garcia versus Tank Davis levels. No. But I, I think the fight, and also it's the zone doing it, so he's they better be taking the guaranteed money because I just it, it's going to take a hit in sales just because the zone is doing it. Mm-hmm. So, but but he's he's only twenty five as he points out, so he has made serious money in the last few years, especially boxing. Let me talk to you about Ryan Garcia and the UFC because he has been yapping back and forth over the last 24 hours with Sean O'Malley. Sugar Sean says to him, brother, I kill you within minutes. And Ryan Garcia says, Sugar Sean, say less for real. Set it up, rainbow head. And then... He said, all right, Rainbow Head, there is only one way to find out. Dana, let's do this. And then again, he said, I'd fight Sean O'Malley in the UFC. That's it. But Dana, you'd have to cut me that real check. Now, what I want to know is if this could happen, because Ryan is under contract with Golden Boy. Sean is under contract with UFC. Is there any way that the UFC co-promotes a, a fight of this magnitude? I think it'd be very possible if Golden Boy would let him do it, because Golden Boy probably has a contract, a part in their contract where they get a piece of any action of a fight outside Golden Boy, right? Uh, they either can co-promote it or, or lease them out, and then they would get usually the standards like 20%, right? So if 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 Golden Boy is willing to do that and and they're willing to pay Ryan Garcia what he wants and Ryan Garcia is probably going to want something I'm going to guess in the neighborhood what he got against uh you know Tank Davis mm-hmm. so let's say 30 more than 30 million so let's say 30 you know 36 or 37 million so when the Golden Boy takes their 7 million he still has 30 million left over uh then he might do it but is the UFC going to pay him 37 million to walk in the cage and take it. That's the part because even if the UFC looked at it and said, this will sell well and it'll do good for our bottom line because there'll be so much interest in it. It's not good to have the other fighters asking, why is this boxer guy coming into the MMA world and getting 10 times what we get? So that's the part I think would, would make them stop making that payment. And this is, we talked about before the numbers getting leaked. I don't doubt that at some point Oscar De La Hoya would let that number come out. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So oh, that would yeah. be your concern. It's like, God damn it, Oscar had to leak the amount. So, so that there is, I, I mean, it's a possibility that could be made, but I don't see it happening because Ryan Garcia is going to want a very large chunk of money to do that. You know, because he potentially is going to make more in boxing. Even if he loses to Haney, he could have several fights to build his name up, and then another big fight will appear down the line, right? So he doesn't want to risk that that prestige he has in boxing by going into MMA and just getting killed for little money. He's going to want a lot of money. Uh, the thing too is I, I do question people seem to assume Sean O'Malley is a big star and I thought he was headed that way, but I'm not getting the sense that he's his biggest star as people <laughs> thought he is, you know, I, Aljamain Sterling swears that he's not, he wouldn't tell me the numbers, but he said that they were not good. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, possible is that his, he appeals to a fan base that does not buy pay-per-views, which mm-hmm. is not good because you're trying to sell pay-per-views, right? right. But it's very possible. He gets a, a younger generation, the, the Twitch video game guys, and they're all, they're all stealing streams. Uh, it also could be possible kind of like Tank Davis, you know, people knew he was a massive star, even though his pay-per-view sales weren't big until he got the right opponent. It's just that, you know, that was building, building, waiting for him to face opponent they're interested in, but the, the interest was there. Um, but I just, I don't get that either. I mean, it, there's always potentially takes off, but I just, you know, the reaction you get from the actual fans in the, um, in the UFC, uh, at the events or uh, YouTube and stuff, you don't see the the massive interest you do with other fighters. Uh, he might get massive interest in the, I guess, what is he in tw- t- t- Twitch or whatever it's called? He does video games. Mm-hmm. Twitch. But yeah, I don't, unless I'm an old man, I don't know any of that shit. But he, <laughs> but he uh, he might get interest in that. But you, I'm not detecting the fight. The people that are the fan base buying papers and stuff are that are that behind him yet. And uh, I mean, part of it could be they're waiting for him, you know, to have a couple more victories to jump on the bank. That, that does happen. Sometimes it takes a while to people just not look at you like a, a, a flash in the pan. They're like, OK, he's done it. Now I'm re- Now I'm willing to put some, you know, 
uh, get behind this guy. But I just so uh, I don't I don't I don't think Garcia the UFC. I just don't see it. It's it's possible they could if they want to, but I don't see it happening. Who's the A side, Haney or or uh, Garcia? <laughs> um, I, I think Haney is actually. Even I though do Garcia too. might be bringing more fans. Haney has the he has the title. He yeah. has the higher position. But who's the A side as far as what's getting paid out? Well, I think I, I either it's I think Haney's getting a little bit more. I bet really? he's getting a slightly. I think he's getting slightly or fifty fifty. But he's using the the leverage of his position of the the titles and stuff. He has he has. There's more risk of him losing. Now, final question: Who wins if they actually fight? Because Ryan's already trying to move things around and this and that. Yeah. It just seems like there's already roadblocks popping up. So, if the fight happens, who wins? Because they already have six Amy fights and they have split the difference between them. But that's been a long, long time ago. I mean, I, I think Garcia's got a shot because he punches hard, but Haney looks just, especially moving up to 140, mm. he looks like a totally different fighter. He looked great before, like he's super skilled, but now he looks skilled and powerful. I, mm. I, I mean, Haney looks like like you know a, a Bud Crawford level talent at this point. Like he's headed that way, mm. so I got to go with Haney. Yeah, I'm. I am too. Uh, again, Ryan could win. He is strong, and he is fast but he's he's i mean he's not even though he got beat by tank he's good he he's might not susceptible. be great but he's, he, he's really susceptible in his body god yeah, dang that kid cannot take a body shot yeah we've seen him but he's uh but he th i mean he's fast as hell mm -hmm. so if you slip up yep he can put you to sleep he throws hard for a guy his size and he you know he throws fast so he's he's there's a risk of a light a lightning knockout no matter what so yeah. i mean even tank tank beat him and beat him kind of clear very clearly i mean knocked him out obviously but there were moments where mm -hmm. you got you were, you were like wow this could go either way based on just a you know a fraction of a second of one of the two connected and then you know haney put him away i mean um tank put him away so but i gotta go haney is just very good at the range and the footwork he just he just looks like a, an elite level boxer Yes, indeed. especially since moving up, he just doesn't, you know, I don't see him having kind of like back and forth Lomachenko fights for a while. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. So, folks, there you have it. Hey, not the face is done for right now. Do me a favor. Follow this guy. He is at Hey Not The Face on Twitter, and you can also direct message him on Twitter. His messages are open, so if you have suggestions, questions, anything at all, do that. I am Crooklyn MMA on Twitter. My messages are also open for the same reason. You can email him his, guess what, Hey Not The Face at gmail.com. You can email me. Guess who I am? Crooklyn949 at gmail.com. And uh, John, what else do you have coming up? Uh, I know you d are still doing If the Shoes Fit. When's the next one of those? We do that Tuesday night. So Tuesday night we'll do that. Uh, I've got a couple articles. I'm trying to get out this week. It just there's every time I start finishing, I read something new, um, go over something. I like, oh, now I got to add those details. I got to <laughs> add that. That's something. It's um, I put way too much effort in some of these articles. So I should have uh, hopefully two articles this week. Uh, one on, um, one on uh, basically using the boxing yardstick for MMA uh, mm -hmm. for UFC for why they're a monopoly. And then the other one is, well, there's a couple possibilities, but the one that's most likely to come out is the Bellator finances, mm, okay. uh, what we got from the, the lawsuit as well. And I guess kind of explains why they were acquired by PFL uh, and, and get those two. And then next week or maybe the week after we should have another Hey Not The Face podcast. We got a kind of a special one we've been talking about for a while. Yes, indeed. And we'll keep that as a surprise for you guys. But for now... We're going to get the heck out of here. And y'all already know the drill, too. So until next time, please stay safe. Ow! Ow! Not the face! Ooh! Ooh! Okay, the face! <laughs>